Okay, hi all, welcome. I had to pop up the hour, so uh, time schedule, so uh, we have to start. Um, uh, my name is Jeffrey. I am with the uh, Open EDS project today, and um, I'm hoping to uh, explain a little bit about um, what we are trying to do, and uh, mostly also get your opinion on things. So, the, the genesis of the whole Open EDS project was fund, funded on, on, based on this fundamental question, and that was, what if uh, storage for containers, the storage system itself, was actually as a container? So basically what we do is what we try to do is take a complete storage system and put it in a container so that it can become a first-class citizen. Shared storage. In the shared storage, 
it is not in the sense of, hey, I'm, I'm having the system sharing this out through NFS or whatever, but this was shared on a fiber channel level. So the actual disks were visible on both controllers. So when you do uh, um, LSP OK or something, both machines would see that disk, right? Um, so the shared storage uh, uh, um, applies to the actual disks. And then they were connected to the fiber channel switches all the way up uh, to the controller. This is basically a front-end, back-end system. So we have the front-end that's serving out the protocols that we all uh, love and hate, supposedly, iSCSI, NFS, um, SMB, or what have you. And then we, uh, at the lower end, we actually have the storage related protocols. And these, these front-end systems that in VRAM, for example, to accelerate write caches, that alludes a little bit to the special hardware, right, that you did not have for yourself. PCI caches, not any, not any V devices, they looked a lot like it, but it was not the same as, a, as an NV device today. And the CPUs were relatively small. Um, I think, you know, uh, I think it was around 2007, they were still using Pentium CPUs in these types of systems, because it wasn't really CPU intensive. So, another fundamental property of these systems was uh, HA failure, right? The storage can never go down, because if my storage goes down, you know, we can all go on. Uh, so, HA failover typically needs to be done in 180 seconds. Um, and this was a, a, a heart limit, so to speak, that was configured on the actual clients running on them. So, you have to install special drivers, right, to set up the settings in the Windows registry or in the 6MS <coughs> or, or whatever operating system uh, you were using. So, they were fine tuned for every operating system that you were using. Um, unified, so block and file servers, but later also uh, uh, VTL, virtual tape library, and backup to disk. Um, and when all your data was on that particular storage system, then you can do some interesting stuff with the data in terms of storage features like snapshot, clones, dedupe, and, and um, replication. Um, the significant downside of this is that these systems were, were huge, hugely expensive, right? They were millions of dollars, uh, euros, and euros after all. Um, and um, not only that, they were they were they were really imposing the way that you operate storage to the operator. So the, the, the specific feature that a storage system could or could not do bubbled all the way up um, to the end user, um, and that was you know I still think uh, a significant downside. So it had a profound impact on what you could do at the top. <coughs> so. Software-defined storage, um, software is eating the world. Software-defined storage happened. Um, the hardware, you know, quality <coughs> hardware as it evolved became uh, more powerful, quicker, and what have you. And, and systems like Luster and Sheepdog and all these open source software-defined systems came along, um, all built on commodity hardware. So Fiber Channel luckily died. Um, they tried, the industry tried to get Fiber Channel over the internet. Um, and luckily it was more dead because, you know, it was a very, very expensive way uh, to keep people on the fiber channel cooling so that they could charge you a lot of money uh, to do so. So luckily uh, for software-defined systems. Um, devices became faster, <coughs> obviously. Uh, Solid-state devices and, uh, uh, and VRAM uh, um, was not needed anymore because now we had SSD devices that did uh, like a Zeus RAM. It was like an SSD device connected to the SAS bus but it was actually a RAM device, so we could really have quite optimized uh, workloads at, at, at certain aspects. But the architecture, however, did not change. Right? The way that we have the separation between computer <coughs> storage is still there. And this is where friction happens um, when we look uh, further down the road, and that is when the containers uh, read happened. And I emphasize that read because containers are not new not at all. Um, originated, I think, in BSD space, it was jails, and there were slab zones, and now uh, Linux with containers. And one fundamental thing is, is that the way uh, we develop, build, and deploy and run applications has changed a lot. Like, we, like I said, we invert it, so we look from the app up all the way down to disk. So what can we do there? And what are the observations that we're seeing? Um, so modern day apps have native scalability features. They have load balancers, they have database sharding, um, they use sophisticated consensus algorithms like Paxos and Graph. So you, you don't really need to have uh, um, a whole lot of storage complexity in order to achieve uh, scalability. Um, the way that we, we deploy them, right? So Kubernetes um, is based on the Google Board paper. If you haven't read it, it's a very, very interesting paper to read. 
kind of explains where Kubernetes comes from. And um, but if you look at how Kubernetes operates with uh, with workloads that can come and go at any given time, persistent or not, um, you kind of wonder, okay, so how do I make that <coughs> work with my storage system? Let alone with different storage systems at different regions and different locations and different customers. So it's a big pain point. So with Kubernetes, we have basically tarballs on steroids, right? It, it is something. You know, it's a computer, it's a defined compute storage network, and everything is confined in a tarball, but it's actually a Docker image or something to that extent. Um, people also got smarter, right? Developers, um, they took, uh, 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 they, they, they accounted for failure. Like, you should always write your software uh, such that it can handle failures. Um, but people also start to write software that are DC aware and even regional. Right? And this is what was very much fueled by Amazon, uh, AWS services with its regions and stuff like that. But people now develop their software <coughs> saying, if I can't get it here, I'll try to get it somewhere else. And don't mind how to get it gets there, but you know, we'll see about that later. So the, the, the mindset of developing applications, uh, high availability has been built into applications, and not as much as, here's my app, I don't know how it works, you just run it on your storage system, and you better hope that your storage system never fails. Um, so the friction between teams is, is still there, probably even more so because the workloads come and go, right? So now, typically you have one VM with one mount point, that's okay, but now if you have 100,000 containers spinning up, and two weeks later they're all gone, and then two weeks later they come up again, you have all these mount points, and those systems have a limit on the amount of number of mount points they can serve, right? Um, also, your storage admin gets a little bit nervous, but he, he has, feels that he has no control. So. Typically what happens is, you know, the, the, the legacy storage system in particular, they try to duct tape this stuff with volume plugins as they call it, right? So instead of doing an API call to something that is sensible, they have this interceptor, they intercept the API call to provision a line in the legacy storage system or whatever. Um, but people generally don't really like that. So the fiction is still there. Um, <coughs> And the other thing is, is that although you are able to mount something from your storage system, you did not unlock the storage features that you might want to use. For example, uh, this data set uh, is a JPEG file, so don't bother to compress it. So in my YAML, I said no compression. Because the developer knows best. So uh, how does this work a little bit? So this is a, 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 a small animation. Um, I didn't make it myself, but I think it was a pretty good one. So the idea is that you have your operator who, who expresses its intent in, in, in YAML. And you know, is this human readable? Yes. Does it not make sense what's actually in the file? Eh, maybe not. But it is human readable. But it's, um, this gets uh, um, executed uh, by the internet environment. And lo and behold, you have your containers. Right? It's magic. Right? Um, but these systems are, are, are not stable. So it's easy to say, how do we do this? So if we take into account the stateful uh, aspect of it, we have our, uh, our storage systems, um, and then we try to somehow, some way, volume plug in our way to make this work again for storage. But the problem is that it's a very tight puppy, and you lose the flexibility of moving systems around, spinning them up as you want, and moving and taking them back out, and all these uh, cool attributes uh, that we are used to. So, the other thing is that you get this I.O. blender. You have all these workloads, and you don't really know how your workload behaves on the storage system because you know, it gets mashed and becomes unclear water. And uh, with all the observability and tracing tools uh, that are available these days, you really don't want that. So <clears throat> an alternative approach is kind of the same idea, um, but now instead of uh, 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 doing it with an I.O. blender, we actually spin up a data container with your workload. Right? It sounds very simple. Um, it's a little bit more complex to implement. Um, but the genesis of the idea, like I mentioned, is that you know, each uh, container workload or pies or microservices um, has its own storage control. So practical thing, so how, how do you do that then? So uh, you have this cube utility that you can run. And you actually open EBS operator. Um, this is a, uh, a database um, that we want to spin up, for example. So we apply that to the Kubernetes system. And then <coughs> Kubernetes does its work. And lo and behold, we have those uh, persistent volume claims, um, as they call it. And um, 
that's it. And so what we really want to achieve is that storage itself just fades away as a concern. Right? It becomes you know, DevOps way, agile. Data, data ability is really important uh, in space. So <laughs> that's a little bit about control plane, right? So I, I skipped over it really quickly. There's a lot more to it. Um, the, the way that we integrate with Kubernetes and all that stuff is on its own. Um, but I also would like to talk now about what OpenBDS is not. And we came to this conclusion because we did our research, of course, looking at ecosystems of applications and how they are developed. OpenBDS is not a security policy. And there are various reasons of why it's not a distributed process. And one of which is that distributed systems in general are relatively hard to manage and debug in production. Um, I have worked on two proprietary uh, distributed systems, and you know you have, you have to handhold them a little bit. And, and depending on how big it is, you probably need a small team, two, three guys at least, to keep them operational on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and to really unleash the full potential of distributed file systems, you need special drivers, right? You cannot just, you know, have your petabyte scale, multi-gigabyte throughput system and just connect with SIFs and just expect that data to come out of the pipe, right? You need to have special clients to unleash the base of the um, Containerized workloads uh, are segregated and, and thus inherently small. So what I mean with that is that instead of having this big data gravity staying in your data center, you have these small workloads with very small data sets. The sum is pretty big, but individually they're relatively small. Right? So talking about a Mongo database with, I don't know, 300 gigs, that's relatively small. If you keep it that small, it becomes very simple to manage. It becomes uh, uh, easy, so to speak, to replicate it. Replicating half a petabyte becomes a whole different problem. See what I mean? And if you can, can, can uh, control this on a per workload uh, uh, system, um, it really becomes uh, uh, feasible. So another aspect is that hardware trends can force a change in the way that we do. And um, you know, we finally can change the actual architecture so to speak, because we still have this same model of, of segregation from storage and compute. And <clears throat> um, a single NMVE device right, can do up to 450 and a half million items, just one device. So do I really need a distributed system to gain high ion? I don't think so. Likewise, do I need to scale to petabytes, like I mentioned, no, not really, because the individual workload is relatively small. So, and one final aspect, and this is really, really fundamental, is that when you're doing containerized applications, you are already working on distributed systems, right? You have all these microservices working together to achieve one goal, and I feel, you know, given the complexity of distributed systems, adding another distributed system to that, right, and making a mash of two different distributed systems, I don't think that that is the right approach. Or not saying that it's not by definition the right approach, but in general, you know, we might want to try something else. So the comparison, uh, and you know, kudos to uh, to the graphics on the right side. The left is actually mine. You probably can see that, but uh, uh, it kind of looks the same, but for a specific application, right? So that's the fundamental idea. So I'll go over the um, components a little bit uh, that are in there. Um, so first of all, there's the controller, like our front end. Um, this is where you connect to, right? And uh, we are starting out with block. Uh, we can do file-based if we want to in the future, um, but it seems to that, you know, block is a lot of, you know, simplistic a little bit, uh, a lot easier to deploy because you don't have to set masks for your mount points and things like that. It's more one-to-one -one mapping to the container. Uh, ISER, that's basically iSCSI over a dependent band, obviously, and NMV over Fabric. Um, they're actually working on NMV over Fabric for TCP. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what to deal with that is, but if that actually you know, gets released, you know, that would be really, really great. Um, so this, this, this controller <coughs> is pluggable, right? So we can just swap out those, those services because they're containers after the all. So that allows us to have a pluggable backend so that we can change the way or change the logic that actually persists the data on it, right? So if you have a, um, uh, a, a database workload, right, you might not want to have a copy on white file system underneath. 
because your database inherently already works with via head logging and things like that. So it's kind of, kind of doubling up. So depending on your workload, you may want to define your YAML a little bit differently, right? So um, declarative state, right? Number of replicas, snapshot schedules, um, the retention of your snapshots if you want to want to replicate it, and the consistency levels are also important. So with that, I mean, if you have a three-way replica, you can say I want to have a forum on the acknowledged right. If I have a forum, then I acknowledge back to the client. So to, to uh, speed up uh, right latency, obviously. Um, and obviously, this also needs to be DC aware. Um, region aware is a little bit more difficult because regions typically have a uh, big distance between them. Um, but DC aware is certainly uh, a possibility. So now we get a little bit to more into the meat of, of storage systems themselves. Um, and like I said, the replicas are pluggable, and we have several. And today I would like to talk about one that we are uh, working on, or at least uh, trying to figure out if it would be a good idea. Um, and that is reusing the DMU layer of CFS. I don't know if people are familiar uh, with CFS. Uh, I think you should. If you're not, you definitely should read about it. But it's a well-proven battle-tested file system. Um, but it has a, a very interesting design. It's more, it's like modeled like a database, so to speak. Um, so we basically took that you know, component of CLS and run that in user space. And one of the properties that it has is that it writes, that each write is assigned a transaction. Right? And these transactions are matched into transaction groups. And these transaction groups are flushed um, to stable storage. And this is done atomic. Right? So either all writes succeed or none of them. So this also means that there is no need for a file system. More often than not, when my, when my laptop dies, I boot up Linux and it does some, I don't know, I know checks or whatever it says. Um, but uh, that's not necessary with, with, with <coughs> this system. And this is important, again, because you, if you replicate data, you want to make sure that you replicate consistent data, right? That's one. The second thing is when you start up these containers based off replica, replicated data, you don't want to have the system go busy for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever, let's do a file system integrity check. And say, oh, I can't repair it. Well, thank you, file system. That doesn't help. Um, so, pool storage model. Um, this is a virtual memory management type like uh, uh, allocation scheme. So, you assign devices to the pool, and the system allocates blocks from that pool. And um, this was considered a rampant layer violation in 2006 by the uh, Linux community. Uh, it was Andrew Morton who made the comment. Um, because, unlike uh, any other system, right now is that it, it, it combines several pieces together. So on Linux, you, you need to partition drives or LLVM things and then put a file system on that. And, you know, that's all taken care of by the system by now. So it is a very uh, uh, easy way to, to uh, consolidate storage devices and basically allocate a piece of that. Um, another thing is end-to-end -end, uh, data integrity. Um, very, very important in the cloud. Um, it does this by checks and all rights. It sounds very simple, but actually it's not because it's also a public right file system. But <clears throat> we all know that, right? Because CFS has been there for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, but now it runs in a container and in user space, right? Um, and the upside of this is that you do not have your dependency because if you move your system from cloud to cloud, because mind you, CFS is not native in the Linux kernel. It has a different license. It's CDL versus GPL. That will make so you can't have it, right? Um, you can, but then you have to install it yourself. And when you move from clouds and you want to scale up and scale down like, like that, you cannot afford yourself to first compile a kernel module, cross your fingers and load it, right, and then actually try to import the data. So no kernel dependencies for this, this dynamic kernel module system, or whatever it is. Um, uh, so the other thing is is that um, um, it does not taint the kernel, right? Uh, so if you load an non-GPL thing and your Linux kernel will say, hey, kernel tainted. Um, maybe that's not a big issue, but if you have a support contract with, I don't know, uh, let's say a Red Hat or, or whatever, um, that actually might become a problem. So with the capabilities of CFS, what it allows us to do is do things like this, right? Um, so the logo says it all, right? That's our mule. It's, 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 a, it's a combination of a horse and a donkey. I didn't know uh, what that was either, but you know, they can't uh, make babies, and that's for sure. Um, so 
Um, so, that, so you, you have your workflow uh, in US Central, and it's running CentOS, right? Uh, or CentOS, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and it, basically, you move your, your, your data and your, your, your compute, so everything uh, in containers, you move that to an Ubuntu machine in, in the U, uh, EU East. And then you decide, I want to move to Amazon, right? And normally, this was really hard because you would either be tied to a Google compute volume or a Amazon volume. Now we have this additional abstraction <coughs> running in the container that makes this possible, right? Um, so again, yeah, your, 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 your data becomes, uh, uh, data mobility becomes a real uh, feature today. So, but there is a problem, right? Um, a big problem, actually, perhaps it's the elephant in the room. Um, so, anybody guess who said, people who think that user space file systems are realistic for anything but toys and just misguided? Anyone you have an idea who said that? Yes, yes. <laughs> he kind of knows a thing or two about computers, right? So, um, but like I said, you know, this is 2011, so I purposely put the date there. Um, fast forward, it's 2018, so seven years down the road, and hardware, like I said, <coughs> forces a change in the way we do things. Good for us. So, Microsoft also moved from kernel back to the space. Microsoft. Could be, could very well be. NTFS. Yeah, okay. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I, 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 I unfortunately, I, I do not have the finances to acquire a license. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so, um, so how do we achieve high performance numbers in user space? Because um, we have a lot of context switches. Every time when I do a mutex lock in user space, the kernel comes in, right? Context switch, we lose performance. The other thing is, is how do we do direct memory access transfer from user space? Because we don't want to copy the data. We want to immediately tell the CPU, hey, there's the data, and just, just grab it and move it to the NB device and what have you. So, um, the other aspect is, is, besides that, the other thing is that the kernel actually becomes a bottleneck, right? So we, have, uh, we are moving towards 100 uh, gig devices network. Um, and if this is interrupt driven, uh, the CPU can't really make, or the kernel can't really make forward progress. Right? It gets interrupted every time. And there is, although Linux is very uh, concurrent, there, is, there are still code paths that are, have to be sequential. Right? So the kernel really can't keep up. Um, the same thing goes for NVDE devices, right? And you know, we're moving to three day cross point, the problem only gets worse and worse. <coughs> um, the other observation is frequency remains relatively stable. Right? Um, core count, the core count goes up. Um, if you buy a, a Mac and the, the, the lamp thing, uh, they have 19 cores. Right? It's just amazing, right? Um, so I see a lot of idle cores somewhere. Um, so you know, it, it, this is not just me claiming this. Um, this is a, a graph from Intel. Um, on the lower side, you see the number of SSDs and. Um, then you see the number of, of IOPS, right? So like I mentioned, the single device, around 450, half a million IOPS. <coughs> and then when you add more devices, the total number of IOPS does not increase. Right, so that's, that's not getting the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak. Um, on the right side, uh, this, is, this is a very contrived example, uh, so I have to admit, but this is a, a, uh, uh, a simple web server, uh, because you can write web servers with, I don't know, four lines of code these days. Um, one is using a kernel network stack, and the other one is using a user-level networking. So it completely bypasses the kernel to process the packet. You can't do anything else on the network card either, so the network card is lost, right? But it does show you that if you do things differently, you can get more uh, performance, so higher performance. So um, how do we do that? So as I mentioned, uh, uh, we bypass the kernel, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's a paradox, but in order to do that, we actually need the kernel, right? Uh, so we instruct the kernel, hey, Mr. Kernel, let those devices go, give me those addresses, and I'll work with them. So there's a trust relationship there going on. Um, and then we use a, a framework called SPDK, um, and, uh, um, and with those uh, systems, uh, we can create uh, 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 containers that do I.O. call work, right? So we, we, I don't know if it's a clear picture, uh, but we map the registers to user space, and an SPDK does its I.O. directly into these uh, addresses. Um, so pull mode drivers, what that means is that we take the CPU, instead of 
using interrupts, we constantly are pulling for work. So if you look at your system, you will have a core that is 100% secure. Right? Um, but that gives you the ability to scale you know, to millions of items that you need. Uh, but you can imagine that if I have a Kubernetes system that I would run, I don't know, 100 containers on that particular machine, and all of them would try to do 100% CPU, that's a problem, right? So what we did is we containerized all the I.O. devices, and we call this an IOC, the I.O. container. And instead of submitting the I.O. to the kernel, we submit the I.O. to the container, right? Um, so it's a user space DFS, so to speak. Um, so, but then we have this problem, okay, so how do I tell my MongoDB instance to do I.O. to your I.O. container? Right? Uh, the world is not going to change because we have this uh, great idea, even though I say so myself. So, a picture, how does this look? Um, so, this is the, the, the IOC, so we put uh, their NICs, uh, SSDs, and CPU, and through the um, uh, CPU mechanism, we can actually control a little bit how much CPU it takes. So, there are some tunables there left still, but the, but the idea is, is that I allocate these, the, these resources for storage on my uh, uh, node, right? Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, we have, I don't know how many cores these days in those high power services. And then we have this bus, so to speak, that we communicate on. It actually really looks like a microservice, right? So I did one. Um, so how do we communicate, right? So the idea here is, is that we reuse proven technology from the virtualization uh, world called uh, vhost and vertios SCSI. Uh, this is done entirely in, in uh, uh, user space. <coughs> um, so the, the IO container basically serves out through this vhost protocol block devices, just like you would connect Kimu to your, um, I don't know, I, I didn't use Kimu, um, but uh, you connect it and you say, you know, use this device. You kind of just basically specify, use this software, because what we will do is we will use uh, a shared memory, and basically you connect to that shared memory system, and that's how we exchange uh, data. <coughs> and because this is a feed-host interface, it is existing, we do not have to change any of the software that's already there. So it becomes completely abstract. Um, so the replica containers uh, connect using this Vert IO SCSI system. Um, they expose sockets, uh, like I mentioned, but there is no Vert IO SCSI available. Uh, these these uh, uh, protocols are embedded into the hypervisor, so there is no standalone li library that you can you know, check out and just run. So we are currently developing that. Uh, looks good. We moved some bits already, uh, so that's really good. Um, another important aspect is, is memory management. So, like I said, we we uh, we out we, we <coughs> memory, so we stick it in the I/O container, but we use huge pages for this, and it's an undocumented uh, feature of the Linux kernel, but these huge, huge pages are thin in memory, so that means that the kernel doesn't move them around. And because the kernel doesn't move them, we can use DMA for that. Right? So we can actually DMA straight to the NV device from the Vert IO uh, IO, and that's what, how we can achieve these, these high numbers. Um, there's also some future work uh, going on. Um, um, I actually checked the fast time schedule uh, from last year, and uh, uh, FDIO, or FIDO, as they pronounce it themselves, uh, we're here. I'm not sure if we can get this here. They are? Okay, great. Um, but they, they basically take this user space networking to the next level with uh, something called DPP, vector packet processing. And they can achieve on this uh, bus, this will just be a terabit per second, right? So from the bandwidth side of things, because when we have these high million, uh, um, 500,000 IAPS uh, SSD devices, we also need a lot of right? And that's why uh, Bio can uh, deliver as a universal uh, data piece from Cisco. And in particular, what we are interested in <coughs> is VPP VCL. Uh, so VPP VCL stands for Vector Vector Processing um, Virtual Communication Layer or something. So it becomes a little bit complex. But the idea is, and this is pretty cool, is that they emulate the native PSD sockets, right? Like a socket, the same PC, that kind of stuff. And you can help you preload it into your existing software and automatically gain benefits of the uh, vector processing. It won't go as fast 
if you would rewrite it from scratch. But, you know, you don't want to rewrite everything from scratch, obviously. So, um, to make it a little bit more clear on, on, on the, uh, 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 oh, sorry, the host user uh, thing, just to make sure. So, we have to host, uh, we have some huge shared pages which are uh, containerized. Um, that's what's the second blue line is supposed to indicate. Um, and, then, and then we build a virtual queue, and then we expose that virtual queue through an IPC mechanism, just a simple shared memory, um, regular VO specifications, uh, nothing magical you know, to that sense. Um, but it allows us to communicate uh, as fast as you would So, um, final slide in summary, uh, open EBS. Um, we would like to bring the advanced storage features to individual containers. And with advanced storage features, uh, I mean things like copy and write, data integrity, because I truly believe that you, know, you need to make sure that the data you write is actually the data you need. Right? Um, cloud native, using the same software development paradigm, but instead of cloud washing an existing system, duct tape it, we actually rebuilt the whole thing from scratch. Um, implemented fully in user space, so we avoid congestion in the kernel. Um, like I mentioned, we'll have scheduling over and what happened. Um, and because of that, it's also multi cloud, right? <coughs> so move your data in and out of uh, different uh, cloud providers. Uh, not just cloud providers, by the way, but also on your own storage system or whatever you have uh, at home or <laughs> in the office. Um, declarative provisioning and protection policies that remove the friction between the teams, right? So there is no more, hey, I need an MMS share, another one, I just gave you one, and things like that, right? And uh, and the other thing is, is that we are not a, cl a cluster storage instance, uh, but instead we are a cluster of storage instances. And that, to me, is a, is a fundamental uh, uh, difference. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm done. Uh, thank you. Uh, and if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Uh, 
I have some uh, Clevo uh, virtual machines using GFAP and Linux containers uh, using Fuse. Uh, will I be able to redesign this paradigm using OpenOPS? Well, so it depends. Well, of course, everything is doable. Um, but <laughs> so one of the things with, uh, with SPDK um, is, is that it has different IO backends, right? So I write the code once, right? But I can select during configuration, you are writing to a regular locational device. In that case, it will use the AIO backend, the Linux code. So then there is the kernel still involved. Then there is the way to, <coughs> to do NMDE, and there is even the Ceph plug, right? And we could even augment it to do cluster. So that would be one way. Um, the other way is that you would, I don't know, uh, uh, just point your uh, e-host to uh, an open EBS e host Yes, example. I would like to get rid of, of the cluster and maybe even of the CFS and do it uh, in user space. Yes, yes. Everything. Yes. Uh, well, that's the trend, right? Yes. Yeah. So, user is a new kernel. So, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> my time is up. Uh,